Thank, thank you very much, Jan, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to Google, and uh, it's a great uh, opportunity to have a chance to, to share some ideas and to get your feedback. So I'm going to attempt to encapsulate my talk fairly briefly. I will try to be uh, concise enough that you have lots of, uh, lots of opportunity to, uh, to, to ask questions, and also if you feel you want to object uh, you have a sense of outrage halfway through and you want to object as I'm going along, that's absolutely fine. Um, it's, you know, let's make it interactive. Um, so the mind is flat, that sounds like a very radical claim, and it is. Uh, uh, but what is it? What is this claim? And uh, the it, intuition will become clearer as we go along, but the thing I want to, uh, to, to kick against is, is essentially in the subtitle, the illusion of mental depth. So the idea I think a lot of us have is that there's this flow of thought, of conscious experience that, that, you're, uh, I, that I'm experiencing now, that you're experiencing now, and that is just one tiny flicker on the surface of a great stream, or maybe a vast river of th thoughts, most of which are hidden mysteriously, but nonetheless flowing out to the sea. And this idea that what we consciously experience is just a, a tiny fraction of the, all the other stuff that our brain is doing, which is also mysteriously uh, hidden thought, is a very, very powerful, uh, powerful intuition. Now, it's a recent intuition. So if you went back 100 years or, well, perhaps 150 years pre-Freud, nobody really had this intuition. The idea then was the mind is that thing which you can experience. So the idea that there could be thoughts that somehow you can't experience would seem inherently a bit crazy. But since, uh, since Freud, and indeed since we've understood the brain a lot better, it becomes much more natural to think, well, hang on, the brain's all doing all kinds of complicated things. Um, perhaps my behavior can be explained by all sorts of uh, mysterious machinery, mysterious mental activity that I'm not aware of. Now, I think, of course, the brain is doing lots of things that I'm not aware of, but they're not thoughts. There's something very special, very particular about the stream of, of, of thoughts, which makes them very different from uh, other things that our brains are doing. And I want to suggest to you that your, your natural pre-theoretic thought that no, actually, my mind is this flow, this stream of, of conscious experience. That is, in fact, correct. Now, if that's right, and we'll see a lot more, we'll see, you'll see some reasons to believe this. It's not just a, a sort of coming completely out of nowhere. We'll see some reasons why you might want to believe this. If it's right, then, in fact, you can only think one thought at a time, and that's the story. One thought at once, no more. Then we somehow seem to give a good impression that our thoughts are highly coherent and integrated. So it's not the case that I just spew out random sentences and here's another one and here's another in a way that seems totally uncoordinated. It's almost as if there was a plan behind these sentences. It's almost as if underneath there's some sort of theory or sort of grand set of principles which I'm drawing on which are from which these, these little individual snippets are issuing. We, but what I think that is telling us is we're remarkably good improvisers. It's not the case, in fact, that there's a script inside me or a set of principles which were generating the script, which I'm just playing out. In fact, I'm improvising now in telling you my uh, thesis, just as you're always improvising whenever you're having a conversation with anybody or doing any uh, social interaction. And yet, of course, we're very, very consummate, very good improvisers. So imagine, for example, the, the uh, case of improvisational acting. You're told, now, play the role of, you know, somebody in a particular situation, a particular age, so off you go. And you start to think, well, you know, here I seem to be saying this, I seem to be saying that, oh, someone's responded. This is the kind of thing we all do in, in, in drama classes. There's a little interchange occurs, a story might start to emerge. Obviously, in that case, we know that the story did not pre-exist, the character we're now creating did not pre-exist either. The suggestion I have for you is that's what you're doing all the time. Right. There's not the case that you're different from your, when you're behaving normally to what you're doing when you're doing improvis improvisational acting, except the part you're playing as your own part. Still, leave those thoughts aside, though. Let's look at some, uh, some examples and some illustrations, and then we'll come back to the, the big picture. Here is a fun illustration, which is fun irrespective of anything else I'm going to say. If you take nothing else away, this is just a wonderful, a wonderful, strange illusion. This is the 12 dots illusion. This is invented by a French vision scientist, Jacques Nino. And uh, you'll know, there are, notice there are 12 dots, 12 black dots on the screen. Can you see them all? See, they're all nice and clear. 
They're perfectly large enough to see. I don't know if any of you are having trouble seeing all of them at once. Uh, so they sort of come and go, don't they? There's no trickery. This is a PowerPoint of the normal kind. Their dots are, uh, are, are, are all visible, perfectly large enough to see. If I took the grid away, you'd see 12 dots, plain as the nose on your face. And when I put that grid in that location, if I move the grid to the side, the 12 dots would pop out again. Um, if they're in that location, though, strangely, they keep popping in and out of existence. So I find, for example, I'm seeing a row of four. Oh, a different, no, no, now a different row of four. Um, now I can see two. Uh, oh, hang on, yep, the bottom rows appeared. It was just three for a minute, and now a fourth one's appeared. It's all very odd. What's going on? Well, the first thing that's going on is this, this should give you a sense of the constructive nature of perception. If you have a secret belief that your perceptual experience is just a reflection of the world, then this should make you doubt that because the world is stable here, but your perception is not stable. Also, think about the chunks you're seeing. Sometimes you see just one dot, sometimes two, then there'll be a row. They're not just picking up, popping up at random. You're finding cohesive units. Things like rows, things like pairs, things like single dots. What you're not finding is, oh, I saw one dot on the top right, and oh, another one at the, at the bottom left. No, you don't see that. These are organized. And only one organization at once. So what you will not find is uh, you'll say, you, you'll find, you will not find yourself thinking, oh, I see um, a diagonal bar and, uh, and a horizontal bar at once. You can't see that. You see one bar, the other stuff is just gone. You can't see anything else. But I'm not sure I can see a diagonal. Oh, hang on. I got, I got six at once there. Yeah, I got a little um, domino-shaped chunk. I don't know if you did. Um, you keep looking, you keep getting different stuff, but it's always organized. So what that's in, implying is that what your, your perception, your conscious experience is tracking is the organizations you're imposing on the world. It's not just the raw stimulus, it's the organizations. And we can only impose one organization at once, and the brain is continually fight, looking for organizations, grabbing them, and then say, I've got that one now, I throw it away. Let me find a new one. I throw that one away, I find a new one. So your brain is continually reprocessing the same material and reorganizing it. So as I look at you now, I'm doing the same thing, but it's not so obvious to me. So I can't, I, I have a sense of a sea of faces before me. I have a sense that there are many, many people and you're all visible in perfect detail and perfect color. But that can't be right, can it? Because you all know from elementary school biology that actually almost all of your color vision is just in a tiny, tiny little um, window, about this big, as I look through the world. That's where almost all the color is in the back of my retina. There's a little bit of color outside, but not much. And in fact, we know that because there are different cells for picking up color, as I'm sure you all know, than there are for, uh, for example, detecting change and detecting just a black and white uh, image intensity differences and so on. So most of the color is, that you can see is in this little window, and yet the world looks colorful. Also, as you know perfectly well, you can only see detail on the favea, the, um, the, this little area where you're looking exactly. So as I look around the world through my little, uh, little um, sort of, as it were, telescope, um, where I'm looking is in, is in real detail, but everywhere else isn't. But that's odd, because I seem to see all of you in full color and in full detail all the time, and that is an illusion. What's actually going on is very much what you see here, is I'm finding one face, then I'm finding another face, then another face, but I can't recognize two faces at once. And in fact, there are lovely experiments, which I'm not going to show you, but there are lovely experiments where you, um, you look at where someone's pointing their eye. In fact, we'll, do, we'll look at a case with reading in a minute, not faces. You look at where someone's pointing their eye in a crowd of faces, and wherever they're looking, there's a face. All the other faces are somehow scrambled. Just, they're just being mashed up. Uh, by some sort of image processing, you don't see anything strange. You just think, oh yeah, everyone's there, perfectly as normal, as you scan what might be a school photograph. Everything is scrambled faces except the one you're looking at. That's fine, you don't notice anything. So I have the feeling I'm seeing you all in perfect detail, and I'm recognizing all these faces, and I recognize it, see the people who are looking interested and a little less skeptical, but no, that's not true at all. Here's something else which is giving you this sense, strong sense, I think, that the brain is much more serial, much more one step at a time than you might think. You find one organization in the world, you, um, you impose that organization, 
and then you move to the next one, then you move to the next one, but you don't do them all at once. You have the sense that you could, you're doing them all at once, but that's an illusion. So this is a lovely ex piece of experimental work done by um, two uh, psychologists of attention, um, Huang and Pashler. They've done lots of great stuff, and this is just one example. That big thing is that you can only see one color at a time. Now you might think, well, hang on, that's just got to be crazy. I mean, look, here are some grids. I mean, I can see more than one color. I, you know, I can see look red and green and, and yellow and blue, can't I? Uh, well, at first, before we do the talk, talk through this little um, stimulus in the way they talked about it, just note the following. If I ask you how many colors are there on that screen, it's quite a hard question. Four is the answer, um, but you have to count. You, can, you don't just see, say immediately, oh yeah, four. If I had four dots on the screen, you could straight away tell me four dots because you're able to process dots in parallel. So four dots, four elephants, you know, four fish, you can say straight away four. If actually five, you can't. Five, six, seven, you do start to have to count. But one, two, three, or four, you can process them in parallel. But colors are not like that. When you see a color, you've got to think, okay, blue, blue got blue. Now red, oh yes, uh, now yellow, and you've got to count them one after the other. And it looks like, according to their theory, what you're doing is when you're focusing on red, yellow has gone, green has gone. There's a general sense of colored stuff, everything else is colored and varied, but the only actual color you're seeing is red or yellow or green. Now, let me try and convince you that, with, of that a bit more uh, persuasively by taking you through one of their <coughs> demonstrations. So here we have these little grids, and you'll notice that in this grid, the, uh, the grids are in fact matching. They are the same grid. Notice how unobvious that is. That is really not obvious. You have to just go through and think, oh, two green squares, two red squares, oh, two green squares, two red squares. You just have to go through step by step and check. Here's something neat. Why don't you just think about the reds and check those? Oh, you can do that, can't you? You can suddenly see, oh yeah, reds are this funny shape here. Look, there it is. Yeah, the reds are the same, okay. And now what about the yellows? Oh yeah, the yellows are the same. And what about the blues? Oh yeah, the blues are the same. Because every time I give you a color, you can suddenly see a pattern in that color. And you can compare, you can see that pattern all at once. You can see all the green, you can see all the yellows, you can see all the blues, and you can see they are the same. But you can't see more than one color. So if I say, okay, what's the sh what shape is created by the greens? Easy. The greens are this shape, the yellows are that shape. But if I say, oh, just what shape would be created by the greens and the yellows put together? No idea. Possible. One color at a time. So, so the thought here is that when you get people to do this task, the best way to do it, and the only way they can do it quickly, is just to look at each color one after the other. Similarly with symmetry. Same trick, of course. Similarly with mental rotation, so let's just do symmetry. So here we're saying, are these two things the same? You can't process color in parallel, so you don't know. But what you can do is think, well, the yellows are the same, oh, and the blues are the same, and I'm doing it as I say it, say it. and the reds, yep, they're the same, and oh yes, the greens are the same. Or well, they have mirrors. I can do that, but I can't do them all at once. So, let's have another look at something uh, Back to, back to uh, something we were talking about a moment ago. I mentioned that, um, this is going back to the seriality of vision, not color anymore. I mentioned that you can have an experiment where we look at, say, a school photograph, and we mash all the faces except the one you're looking at, and you notice nothing unusual. This is the original demonstration of that type of phenomenon, which was done actually in the mid-70s by Keith Rayner, a very famous psychologist of reading. And the, this experiment became possible because it was, became possible to track people's eyes and create change the computer display instantly as they, not quite instantly, but instantly enough um, as they move their eyes across the screen. So this is the, the, ver the reading version of, um, of the experiment I mentioned with faces. So what we have is a sentence, which in this case is, it's remarkable how little we actually see at any instant, even though. And here's your eye. And when your eye is here, we crea create a little window of 15 letters, 10, 10 roughly um, to the right, 5 to the left. If you're reading a language like Hebrew, which goes the other way, then you'd have the, um, uh, you'd have the window larger in the other direction, towards the left. 
because the brain is slightly more interested in previewing than looking backwards. So what you do is you just change all the other letters to X's and you just allow a little window of lucidity here. Now as soon as you move your eye to here, suddenly the window of lucidity has moved. And again, and again, and again, and again. And you can read the sentence quite happily, you don't realise anything funny. If you look over the shoulder of the person reading the sentence, you think, what's going on? There's X's everywhere, why don't they see it? But of course they don't see it, because exactly where they're looking, there are proper letters. It's a very, very strange, a very, very strange illusion to be inside. Oh, another thing you might be interested in is you might think, yeah, but what's going on when you're moving your eyes? I mean, all these letters are changing, aren't they? They're changing from letters to X's and back. I mean, yeah, it's a bit odd. Why don't I notice that when I move my eye? Oh, well, that's because when you're moving your eye, you're blind. You simply can't see anything. Um, it's re again, the consciousness fools us completely. As I look around the room, I think, oh, no, it's all a smooth, continuous, um, continuous perception. Now I see this, now I see that. It's flowing effortlessly from one thing to the next. It's not just staccato. But in fact, I'm seeing a scrap of information, then blindness, then scrap of information, then blindness, then another scrap of information. And I'm putting all these together to, to give a sense of, of a rich, continuous conscious experience. But it's an illusion. Now, I want to switch gears slightly to think about um, a different way in which uh, our uh, thoughts uh, work very differently from the way we imagine. So I, we improvise our way to creating the visual world. We scramble together a sense of the richness of vision through these tiny uh, snippets. And we, the illusion is so convincing, we, we think it's real. Um, but let's now look at something more abstract. Let's look at uh, perceptions of, people, of emotion. So here is a, a famous example by Lev Kuleshov, a Russian film director known as the Kuleshov Effect, much um, talked about by Alfred Hitchcock and, and very well known in, in the cinema world. So this is done with stills, but in fact it's uh, better done with, uh, with moving pictures. So here is, um, I think it's Isaac Muzukin, who's a, uh, one of um, Kuleshov's actors. This is going back to the uh, early days of cinema in, in Russia. And here he is, paired with a, uh, a sad scene, a, a, a child lying in a coffin. And if you look at this on, on its own, this pair, you think he's looking in a very subtle and kind of uh, nuanced way, looking utterly grief-stricken. On the other hand, if you put him next to a bowl of soup, he starts to look hungry. Uh, and so, of course, you don't see the effect quite as strongly here because I put them all together. Um, but if you block out the others and just focus on this, you'll find he's now looking He's looking kind of interested in this soup. He's, he's looking slightly hungry, but he's a very subtle actor. He's very, very, uh, he's very, very uh, understated. And here he is looking somewhat lustful as he looks at this, this young woman here. So now you see, again, he's such, such a marvelous, marvelous actor because of his incredible understatement. Um, but of course, you will have guessed, this is the same picture. Um, and indeed, I think this is you know, Kuleshov's uh, great insight is that when we're interpreting a face, we interpret it, a lot of the emotion in that face based on the context. So in fact, a lot of the secret, at least I think in his view, of good acting is not to, not to um, be too expressive because you want the viewer to impose the appropriate meaning onto your face. And if you're too expressive, they can't do that. If you're kind of forcing the, or forcing the issue. But that's interesting because this gives, again, another illusion. You think when you look around the world at faces, you think the, all the activities in the face, the face just has the look of lustfulness or hunger or, or sadness but in fact you're imposing that you're imposing that because of your wider understanding of the of the situation so we're improvising not just our um, constructing the, the world from snippets in a way that fools us we're also imposing meaning on snippets here faces in a way that fools us we think that the meaning is in the face but in fact the meaning is uh, being imposed from outside Here's another similar example. This is a, a US senator running for election. Now, if you take this face here and blow it up and cut out everybody else, this fellow looks really very angry. He does not look happy. On the other hand, this is uh, Webb, Jim Webb in his uh, milieu uh, in the actual election rally. He's looking triumphant. Now, how odd. This is the same picture. But in the context, you realize, yeah, look of triumphant, triumphant, delight, victory is going to be ours. Whereas here, he's looking extremely unhappy indeed, and frustrated, things are desperate. Now, that's interesting because 
That's, uh, that same insight applies to our interpretation of our own emotions. So you might think, well, if I'm looking at somebody else, maybe their face is a bit of a cipher, and maybe I do have to use other information to quite work out whether they're angry or they're delighted or whatever it may be. Maybe the, the, I have to impose extra information. But of course, for myself, I just know what I'm thinking, don't I? And I think that's a really fundamental illusion. Because actually, the physiological signals we get from our own bodies are extremely sparse. And roughly speaking, and this is too, too crude, but not much too crude, roughly speaking, we have two types of signal. One is saying, what's my arousal level? So it's saying, you know, I'm really sleepy and bored, or I'm kind of excited. And the other one is saying, I'm interested and want to approach and engage with this object or person or thing, or the opposite. I want to remove myself. But that's about it. Right? That's about all you have to go on. So then you have to take that very minimal physiological signal, which is like a very, very uh, unexpressive face, but an internal one, and you have to think, well, what's going on in the world? And think, oh, I guess oh, this, this physiological signal must be telling me I'm angry, or it must be telling me I'm amused, or it must be telling me something else. So your own physiology is like a really, really unexpressive face. It's like uh, the, the, what the example that Lev Kuleshov gives. And to actually make sense of your own emotions, you have to interpret. So there are lots of lovely experiments. I'm not going to talk about them now. But there are lots of lovely experiments where we f you, you can show that people in the very same physiological state will interpret that state as anger or uh, um, delight or amusement just based on contextual shifts. So the idea that the, the emotions well up from within you is really an illusion. In fact, you've got a very thin signal, and you're interpreting, what on earth must I be feeling now? Oh, I bet it's this. <coughs> Telling a story, improvising your own, uh, own emotional thoughts. Let me um, give you an, an example of the improvised nature of choice now. This is a famous experiment done by uh, Lars Hall and Petter Johansson. So Petter was a postdoc of mine years ago, but did this experiment before he ever joined my lab. And have, I have no, I can take no credit for it, sadly. I wish I could. It's a very clever experiment. Um, so the experiment works like this. You give people two options, and the, the task can be anything. But the most famous original task is, uh, which of these faces do you prefer? So it's done with faces, but it doesn't, doesn't have to be. I might say about, a bit about some of the other options in a moment. So we say, you say to somebody, which of these faces do you prefer? And they say, oh, I, uh, yeah, it's kind of difficult, but maybe I sort of slightly prefer that one. So that's, that's, that's the phase. So this is step one. Look at these faces. Step two, that's my favorite. Step three, oh, well, have a closer look at that one then. But step four, trick. I've given you the wrong one. OK? The, the, you do this task a lot, and you only do a trick occasionally. So in fact, I something like 32 trials with three tricks. And if you're wondering, oh, I wonder, do they notice the trick? A, when you ask them, they don't seem to have noticed the trick. But B, and much more cleverly, um, Petter asked people, Petter and Lars asked people, uh, well, they say, in, in the experiment we just did, um, half, for half the subjects, we did some tricks on them. And for half, we did no tricks. Which one were you? So this gives them the chance to say, well, I did feel a bit you know, funny about some of them. I bet you tricked me. But they don't. Most people don't. I mean, about 80% of people don't think they've been tricked. 20% do. So what's, what, what's interesting about the people who've been tricked, though, is that they are now asked to explain their choice. And they do, very happily. They will give an explanation for the thing they did not choose, and it's a perfectly lucid explanation. It's just as long. It's just as fluid. It's just like all the other explanations they give. But it can't be the right. It can't be anything other than a rationalization. They can't be doing anything other than improvising, because it's the wrong thing. So the thought here is that you're an improviser. You're improvising the visual world. You're improvising facial expressions. You're improvising explanations for your choices. You're rationalizing. We're all sort of aware that we do a bit of rationalization. The illusion is thinking, yeah, but sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just look deep inside to, my, to the actual causes of my own thoughts and think, ah, I know what I really was doing there because I've gone back into, as it were, into my own mental history and picked out the real reasons. But you can't do that. All you've got is this flow of experience. All you've got is the um, sensory um, experience of the world, and you've got your own voice and your own uh, sub-vocalizations, little linguistic stuff flowing through your mind, and you've got some physiological signals. That's it. 
you have not got access. You've not got some privileged key into your own memory. Here's a, a lovely experiment um, from 1974, another ancient experiment, but a very nice one. There are many more since, but this is the classic, um, which gives you a sense of how powerful these effects are. So this is uh, an experiment which, done, which was done on the um, campus of the University of British Columbia. And on that campus, apparently, I've not been, on, been to this, but apparently there is a very high and wobbly bridge like this one. There's also a low, non-wobbly bridge. What you do to, in this experiment is you station experimenters, attractive female experimenters, at one end of the two bridges. Male bridge crossers cross. They're then interviewed on some fairly pointless um, questionnaire survey type of uh, study uh, by, the, by the female experimenters. Then the experimenter says, oh, well, for ethical reasons, if there are any issues raised by this survey, which there certainly won't be, um, you, ha you, you can contact me if you have any problems. Here's my phone number. The question is, do, do, do the bridge crossers call? Now, the first thing is, yes, they suspiciously do call quite a lot, which is a bit weird because you know, there's just no issues raised by this survey. But excitingly, and this was the prediction, the bridge crossers who've gone over the high wobbly bridge call about twice as often. Now, why is that? Why is that? Why is it that, that really, a day later or two days later, they pluck up the courage and they, they phone that, that experimenter uh, with some, on some pretext? Why are they doing that? Just because they walked across a high bridge? Well, the, the, the answer is, or at least this is the prediction and the, the explanation in the study, the answer is, when you've just walked across a high bridge, you're really full of adrenaline. It's kind of a scary experience. Then you meet someone and you're full of adrenaline. You think, wow, you know, why, wh what's with the adrenaline? Well, obviously, this person must be just like fantastic. I must say, it's totally, you know, totally, they're just totally for me. They just, there's just this amazing sense of chemistry. What there is, is a huge amount of adrenaline flowing around, but that's just because you've walked across a big, high bridge. You, however, make the, the as, as the psychologists call it, attribution error. You don't realize, oh, it's the bridge, isn't it? Of course. You think, well, it must be the person. And therefore, you form this belief that they're somehow very, very attractive to you, and you really must give them a call. Um, and that, as I say, there are many, many such, such experiments. But the thought there, again, is that we have this idea that we have mental depths from which things kind of mysteriously appear. So if you think, oh, well, who am I attracted to? Well, that's a, that's a very hard question, that is. It's, you know, there's all kinds of deep subterranean forces determining this, and they just burst forth mysteriously. Um, I just you know, I have these strong, stable preferences. They just come from nowhere. I don't know what they, where they come from. But actually, that's a bit of an illusion. In fact, uh, you're trying to interpret your own experience as you're going through the world. And if we trick you, we distort that experience, then you interpret it wrongly. OK. Now. Why are people not feeble, um, uh, highly unstable creatures just you know, f flitting from one random improvised thought to the next? Why are we able to be so high, highly integrated, stable characters who are able to lead uh, sort of organized lives? Well, the answer I want to give to that is that you should think of your mind as a bit like a tradition. So the, the, the thought here is that you can only think one thought at a time, but every thought is shaping the next thought and is shaped by the previous thought. So you're a bit like a drop of water running down a landscape. The, where the drop of water falls when it rains, where those droplets fall, is determined, and where, and where they flow, is determined by the, the landscape that's already there. But that landscape is itself created by all those previous droplets. And of course, each new droplet just makes a tiny change to the landscape and will therefore affect future droplets. So you're, like a, uh, you're sort of like a landscape created by sort of endless flow of, flow of water, whereas what there isn't in the landscape is a sculptor. You might think, yeah, but I mean, you know, how, do these, how, how do these rocks have such interesting shapes? Or how, how, is, how come the shapes are so, so stable? Or how come the different kind of hills have a sort of similar look? The answer is not that they were created or designed or they, there's, any, uh, there's any agency behind them. They are the process of a long period of one, each force, each little tiny change, changing the next, changing the next, changing the next. And I think our minds are very similar. Now, a lot of, but I also want to give you the sense that the way in which we are cha changed by our experience is incredibly flexible and creative. 
So, so far you might think, this is a bit of a negative story. I thought I could see this whole world. I thought I could interpret people's faces. I thought I understood where, where my feelings are coming from. And you're telling me I don't. This sounds rather bad. But it, actually, I think it's sort of the opposite. I think in reality, we're astonishingly powerful creative machines. We're able to make sense of the world around us. We're able to make sense of facial expressions, um, experiences, in a way that is extraordinarily labile, creative, inventive. So I want to give you just a hint of that. And, of course, and then, of course, we create traditions. But those traditions are not some sort of blind copying. They're the traditions that we create in culture, the arts, language. They're the extraordinarily, and indeed science, the extraordinarily complex, rich things we can create are all created by gradual, incremental, one thought at a time growth on, on this uh, sort of great landscape. So here's something a bit more about, about focusing on our, our creativity, our po from a positive standpoint. So here, here in this example, we have the wonderful creativity of perception. So I, anyone who thinks uh, in a negative mood, or oh, like my, uh, some people in my family keep saying things like this, well, I'm just not, I'm just not creative. I just, you know, my brain just doesn't work that way. Think again when you look at this amazing image here. This is an image invented by a Japanese vision scientist, Idasawa. And uh, of course, you can see that it is uh, a sphere, sort of a snooker ball or billiard ball, white billiard ball type of thing, it's pretty three-dimensional. And you can probably have a sense, although it's an illusion, but you have probably have the sense that the, the white in the ball, ball area here is just a little brighter than the surrounding white. But of course, that's not actually true. What's happening here is that you are taking these pieces, these exact pieces, and turning them into a three-dimensional object. A spiky sphere and that is an amazing thing so those exact spikes those those fragments when they're organized in a special way your brain immediately thinks oh I can see I can see a clever way of organizing these it's like a puzzle but the brain can easily easily see the answer you can explain why those shapes are the way they are by thinking oh yeah they're all about the same length spikes they're cones they're black they're on a white sphere there's all kinds of um, issues with uh, bits of bits being cut off by the background so you can see this spike is rather short but of course it is because it's pointing away from us and it's occluded by the bit of billiard ball and then this one for example is coming towards me so all of this is perfectly explained by this amazing insight but that amazing insight is something your brain just creates in a flash so it's not that you're, you're a kind of pawn or a kind of simple a uh, creature which is just being pulled or pushed around by your environment. You're an incredibly powerful organizing machine. And that's, I think, the reason you can only do one thing at a time. The, the, when you're deploying your concentration, your attention on a particular object, you're able to bring to bear all the other stuff you know. All the experience you have of, um, in this case, three-dimensional objects can be brought to bear to make sense of this thing. That's a really hard thing to do. And that's why you can only do one at a time. But don't underestimate the, the spectacular inventiveness required to do it. There's you know, the possible number of objects that could under, underpin this, um, this, 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 this set of markings on the page is vast. But your brain immediately thinks, oh, white sphere, spikes. Another illustration is uh, faces. So here are some found faces. Faces that just happen to be in the world. And uh, I love these faces. Um, I think one of the things that's nice about them is, first of all, we immediately see them. And they are nothing like faces, are they? I mean, they're nothing like the faces that we see every day. They really have to take a massive creative leap to think, well, you can sort of think that's sort of a little like an eye, and that's a little like an eye, and that's a little like a nose. And I suppose this is kind of like a mouth. Not very much. You have to make an enormous metaphorical jump to get from the actual faces of actual people to these. However, your brain's really good at making creative metaphorical jumps, and it does. The other thing I want to stress here is just how emotional these faces are. And they're just as emotional as any, laden with, with emotion as any um, real human face. For example, there's a sort of anger to this face, but also a slight kind of cross-eyed sort of loopiness. I mean, you're not quite sure whether to be afraid of this face or, or to think it's slightly ridiculous. This is an eager to please face. It really wants you to like it. It's trying to look kind of happy, but it's not. It, it feels like I'm trying to hold things together, but I'm not quite sure I can. It's a cheese grater, but nonetheless, that's how it seems. <laughs> what about this, this fellow here? Now, he's kind of a benign face, a little bit drunken. Not, you wouldn't want to ask him a difficult question. He's looking a little bit like he's a little lost, but nonetheless, um, it's, it's a friendly face. 
This poor fellow, this face here, is very, very concerned. There's a, there's a definite sense of fear and confusion. It doesn't know what's going on, but it's not good. Now, how is that possible? How is it that we not only see that these are faces, but we impose such richness on them? It's amazing. Of course, these faces don't really have an inner life, but we impose inner life, we impose interpretations on everything, including each other, including ourselves. To finish, I want to finish with an analogy, going back to the, the metaphor, the mind is flat, and the idea of mental depth. And I want to do that by pointing out some lovely um, figures by a, uh, a, a, an artist earlier in the, uh, early in the well, middle of the 20th century, Oscar Reutersfahrt. And uh, he produced what many of you will think of as Escher-like um, stimuli, if you know, you know, many of you will know Escher, uh, but around the, around the same time, in, in some cases before Escher. And they're rather beautiful, and here are some stamps. He's a Swede, and the uh, Swedish uh, Postal Service used some of his figures on a famous set of stamps. Now, the nice thing about all of these is they are impossible figures. So if you look at them casually, you think it's just some blocky three-dimensional object. If you look more closely, you start to think, hmm, which, where's the front and where's the back of this thing? And after further contemplation, you start to realize these figures actually don't make any sense at all. So if you look at this one, for example, this is a, essentially the Penrose Triangle, although Reutervard invented the Penrose Triangle around the same time um, as Penrose and Penrose's uh, original uh, paper, completely independently. Um, and this one, so that's, that's a, so it looks like, um, for, for starting here, say, it looks like we're going back. Back we go, back we go in space, further and further away. Now let's go down here. Oh, we're going back further. Yep, further we go. And then we've gone back, we've gone back into depth, we've gone back further into depth, and now we're just going vertically. That's level in depth. And yet we end up where we started. That's a bit weird. So it's like I started here, I went back a bit, then I went back a bit more, and then I went up, and I've ended up where I started. And that, that can't be right, can it? Um, and indeed, it can't be right. This is not a possible three-dimensional object. Uh, what about this one? Same sort of thing. Just trace, trace round uh, here, and you'll find something very odd happens as soon as you start to loop back to where you started. It's just, this, this just makes no sense. Similarly, this one too. These are very interesting in themselves when you think about what they mean for vision, because they're telling us that we're only able to organize one part of the stimulus at once. If we could organize the whole stimulus, these are very simple compared to the world around us, we should immediately say, these are impossible. The light should be, the alarm bells should be going off. Because if we could try to integrate this entire stimulus in one go, we'd fail because it doesn't have an, an interpretation and we'd think, oh, impossible object. But in fact, we only realize it's an impossible object by going slowly. We think, well, that bit makes sense. That bit makes sense, that bit makes sense. Oh, but hang on, I'm trying to piece them together. Oh, they don't fit together. And that's an effortful, slow, difficult thing. But so that's interesting in itself because it's an illustration of the sequential local aspect of vision. You, can't, you feel you can, in some sense, see the whole object and you can see that it's three-dimensional, but that must be an illusion because if you could really see it, you'd realize it wasn't three-dimensional. But it's an, it's an interesting illustration in another way. These are stimuli that look locally like they have depth. You look at any piece of them, perfectly reasonable depth-like object. You try and put the different pieces together, and they do not fit together. And that is a very interesting analogy for the mind in general. So if I ask you to explain your actions or justify your beliefs, you'll tell me a story. I mean, why did you come a particular route to work? Oh, I have a story for that. Um, you know, why did you, you know, maybe you take, take the tube, uh, so which tube? Oh, you have a story for that. And I ask you more questions. There'll be more stories and more and more and more. And they all sound very convincing. They're just like each patch of the image, which looks three-dimensional. But if I try and get you to put those stories together, they will not make sense. And this is the thing that people realized in artificial intelligence in the 70s and, uh, and before, when they started to try to get knowledge out of experts. So you'd think that experts know how they do things. So you just ask them, well, you're an expert chess player. So what do you do in this position and why? You tell me. And the expert chess player says, well, this is obviously the right move. And um, uh, well, here's the story. But then you do it again and again and again. And the stories do not make any sense. They are not coherent. Each story sounds fine, but they do not fit together because they are rationalizing. They're not really going in and saying, oh, yeah, actually, I have this, um, I have this deep insight into my mind. I can just look, into, look at these inner thoughts. No, they can't do that. 
what they're doing is they're rationalizing, and they're rationalizing in a very convincing way, but all the different bits of rationalization don't fit together. So I think, in fact, this mind just flat cover uh, has a, uh, exactly this quality, uh, has, a, has the look of a three-dimensional object, but it isn't. And this is to illustrate the idea that actually your mind itself, as you traditionally conceive it, as we traditionally conceive ourselves, is itself an impossible object. We imagine that I don't just have one or two beliefs that I've just thought of at the moment. Uh, each, each belief is um, justified by a huge network of beliefs. It just goes on forever. And my motives, I can think of one or two, but there must be many, many of them. And they themselves are all carefully interlinked and, and intertwined. But in fact, as, you, as soon as you start to explore that, and that's quite a big theme of the book, which I haven't really talked about today, but if you, as soon as you try and articulate and explore the connections between all those different snippets of information, snippets of belief, snippets of motivation, they do not fit together. In fact, your mind is an impossible object in just the same sense as uh, Reutervard or Escher's um, strange impossible objects. So I think the, the, the take home message is that we are amazingly creative, stupendously free uh, improvisers, and each improvisation is done at the, on the basis of the last improvisation. And we're so convincing that we think there's a script. It's like improvisational actors who are so good, you think, oh, you, you just learned that, haven't you? Somebody wrote that script for you, you're reading it. But there is no script, they are improvising. And we're so fluent, we're so good, that we don't realize, in fact, we're making it up as we go along. Thank you very much. We do have time for questions. Please raise your hand. So I don't really know how this is different from exactly what Freud said. I mean, um, th there we have a set of illusions, um, you know, slips of the tongue or whatever that are, that are created by the dynamics of mm -hmm. improvisation. You've you created this kind of strange thing called a script. Everybody knows it's not mm -hmm. a script. Actually, there's some internal generative processes which produce um, uh, perceptions and these can be more or less integrated at different people. So I just want to know exactly, mm. you know, it, it seems as if Freud was here. Uh, if Freud was here, he wouldn't have any problem with anything you were saying. So I, I, can you just deal mm. the deathly blow to the whole thing? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'd like to think Freud would, I mean, I'd be delighted if Freud turned out to agree, but I think he wouldn't. Because for Freud, the, the conscious is only a tiny fragment of thought. So, the, the, so I would agree that there's a lot of stuff, the brain's doing a lot of stuff we're not conscious of. In fact, everything, pretty much. The only things we are conscious of are essentially sensory experiences, and I would include in that um, imagery and also language. But essentially, we're only conscious of very narrow sensory experiences. That's it. But I think for Freud, he'd say, no, no, you, that, that's right. You're, 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 the, 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 those are the thoughts you're conscious of. But there are other things which are a bit like that. They're just hidden. <laughs> So there's something else which is a bit like there's a, Freud would say, I think, there's an iceberg, and you can, there's a tip of the iceberg, uh, which is the conscious thoughts, and then below that there are all kinds of other con unconscious processes. Now I want to say, no, that's a, that iceberg metaphorism is a mistake. There's the, 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 the things that, as it were, are visible are nothing like the things that are invisible. And so what, what's invisible is essentially the, the vast tradition, the vast history of previous thoughts you've had. And what you're doing when you're coping with the current situation is you're drawing on all those past experiences of previous situations. You're not actually, there's no, as it were, underlying generative mechanism you can, you can uh, uh, refer to. All you've got is, as it were, lateral connections between, between uh, one thought and the next. So it's a disagreement about the content of that, the, the nature of the things underneath. Because I suppose what, mm. when you're describing those illusions to us, what you're doing is equivalent to a kind of therapy in, 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 in making conscious yeah. into thoughts the processes that resulted in that illusion. So yes, although I, that's, I, that's absolutely right. But the way I would think of it is that we think of it as a process where something that was previously unconscious is now con uh, conscious. But I think that's uh, itself a mistake. I think the, it's not that there was a thought which I wasn't aware of and now I am aware of it, it's simply that the mechanisms are completely and utterly, utterly different. Um, so for example, if you think about the patterns in language, 
very, very, they're very, very complicated. We learn them, it appears, in a very exemplar-based way. So I hear different phrases, I generalize from those phrases, I gradually assemble a language as a child. And that language has all kinds of complicated patterns. And as a linguist, you might say, oh, look, you, you didn't know about this complicated rule or pattern, did you? Um, and the answer is absolutely not. So the, 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 the explicit task of finding patterns in language is a total mystery to me. But I think what's going on there is not that you're making explicit to me something that I sort of knew. It's just that I've learned all these fragments, and these fragments create this pattern, and I never knew nothing about the pattern. I only, only knew about the fragments. The things I know about are things that are always either they're conscious now or they were. So yes, it's a, it's a disagreement about, as it were, what the substrate is. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this is an important question uh, that was asked about, especially when you argue with psychoanalysts. Mm -hmm. So uh, would, would Freud say, yeah, I agree completely with the landscape image, except that the landscape is moving by itself or is yes. changing with other drops? Yes, I think that's probably right, actually. So I'm very much hostile to the idea, or at least I think there's not much experimental evidence that the landscape is moving by itself. Um, I mean, in, in fact, the brain, when you're focusing on a particular task, your entire brain, I mean, this is too extreme, but large areas of your brain are really focused on whatever that task is. So if you're, you're reading a word, or you're listening to a piece of music, if you're locked on to that stimulus, I mean, vast tracts of your brain will be active in, in locking onto that stimulus. Now, of course, there's, there's lots of autonomous stuff going on. You're still breathing, you're not falling over. There's all kinds of things which are actually relatively separable from, from general cognition. But high-level cognition, the ability to, to freely um, attend to one thing and then the next, seems to be roughly sequential. And whatever it's locking onto at, the, at any given moment is roughly bl obliterating the possibility of locking onto anything else. So I think that's exactly right. I think the, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, at least a popular illusion we have is that as well as the conscious processing that's going on, my brain just doing all kinds of secret processing in the background, just thinking about the kinds of things I normally think about, but thinking about them in the background. Whereas I think the brain is thinking about lots of other things, but they're things like not falling over. They're very different in character. Yeah. Um, different sort of question. Um, one characteristic of many autistic people is that they find it difficult to infer emotion from faces. What does your theory kind mm. of say about that? That is a very interesting question. I mean, I don't have any specialised knowledge here, but I do think it's possible, at least it's interesting to imagine, that perhaps the, the big problem is the, the contextual uh, integration of context, which I think I know some theories of, of autism do focus on the idea that um, generally trying to create holes out of many individual parts is quite difficult and the t there's a tendency to focus if you have autism on, on parts and analyze those parts very in, in detail rather than be able to integrate. So it could be, at least one part of the story could be that um, trying to interpret faces requires this, this integration not just the of the visual stimulus but actually all of this surrounding, surrounding stimulus which may be difficult to do. You're right. Your, some of your definitions seem a bit tautologous. So you say you can only, there's only conscious mm. thoughts, but you define thoughts as things which are conscious. And you say you can only do one thing at once, mm. but say my hobby is dancing, mm. and while dancing with a partner, I can hold a conversation with mm. her. And you would say, oh, you're only, the only thing mm. you're actually doing is the conversation and the dancing doesn't count mm. as a thing because you're doing it at the same time, so it feels a bit... Yeah, no, you let, me, let, me, let me make that a bit more precise. So, so the, 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 thing, the, the, right, the more correct story, but a bit more complicated story, would be to say any bit of brain, I would argue, can only do one thing at a time. So you've got a complicated set of networks in your brain. If those, if those networks, each network can only do one thing at a time. Now, if it's the case that you can take on two tasks, which, as it happens, do not use overlapping networks, then you're fine. Now, if you're beginning dancing, this is not the case, because there's so much top-down control which is required to keep, you, to keep you doing the right moves in the right order, then there's a lot of overlap between the, the same top-down mechanisms you, you need to run a conversation. But, but so for, for, for two complicated tasks, you're done for. But for things that you've done a lot, some, some tasks are, are, um, are, are possible to, to run in parallel. Now, an example I talk about in the book is a very, very nice example of touch typing and sight reading. So you get... Um, so you get, oh, is that right? Yeah, so, so sight, sight reading, um, 
sight reading and shadowing. That's the one I want to, to focus on. So here you are as a very experienced pianist, your sight reading piece of music, and also you're hearing in your ear a voice, and you just have to say what the voice is saying. And wonderfully, you can do that. Uh, not if you're not a very good pianist, you'll totally fail. But if you're a good pianist, the sight reading is a relatively autonomous process. The re 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 regenerating what you're hearing is a relatively autonomous process. It wouldn't be if it was in that language you weren't very familiar with. That would become a very hard process. So it has to be strongly automated processes. And, and so, yes, there are a few examples where you can really cleanly see that the brain networks are not overlapping and then we're fine. But that's really the exception. But they're very important exceptions, very interesting exceptions. Well, for example, I should say driving is actually not one of these exceptions. So if you happen to think, as I'm driving along, um, I can have a chat on my, my, my hands-free phone with no interference, you'd be absolutely wrong. There's lovely experiments showing that um, even if you have to do the most trivial auditory task, monitor some auditory signal, that really screws up your ability to break, for example. So that's, that, you know, our intuitions about what we can automate and what we can do separately is not very, not very good. Often we're actually swapping from task to task very quickly. My understanding is that uh, sleep is used for the organisation of memories. So how does that fit into your theory? Yeah, so I think it's not, under, it's not very well understood how sleep plays a role, but it does seem to play an important role. And I suppose this account can e deal with that to the extent that that process is mediated by dreaming. Because in dreaming, you're, you are just replaying. I mean, this is the, the whole replay theory you get a lot in neuroscience. So the idea is that you're doing something a bit like being awake, um, and you're you know, doing more fl conscious flow of experience, and that is allowing you to reprogram the system. The, if it's the case, so, so what, what this, this approach rules out is the idea that there's some other process which is not going through the process of essentially of conscious experience, yeah. which may be too strong. I mean, I'm not, this is a particularly strong view. I think it's roughly right. There might be some, uh, some processes which, uh, which, are, which are going on at a completely non-conscious level that but I'm, I'm going to keep going with, going with the strongest possible uh, stance until I absolutely force not to. But, but I, think, you know, that's, I think that's broadly right. For example, if you give people problems to solve and you, they sleep on them, yes, they're slightly quicker than if they hadn't slept on them to solve them when you ask them again. And that seems to be pretty much entirely explained by the fact that they've forgotten the errorful ways they started, tried to solve them the first time. So I give you a problem, you think, oh, is it like this? You're wrong. If, you, if you're right, you solve it. But if, you, if you're wrong, you, get, you, 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 you conjure up the wrong mental set, the wrong interpretation of the problem, you get stuck, then you go to sleep, you've forgotten now, and you're quick. But there seems to be no evidence that you, as it were, solve the problem in your sleep. So really active reprocessing, although we intuitively feel we're doing that from time to time, is almost certainly an illusion. I remember that about this, I just wanted to make a remark. I remember that Michel Jouvet, I think the discoverer of uh, REM sleeping cats, w uh, suggested that you make up the dream as you re recall it. In fact, you don't recall the dreams, you just make it up. So that kind of goes in your, uh, with what you're saying. But my uh, question was about thought without language and mm. mostly like mm. mathematicians like Adamar or mm. um, how they solve a problem by climbing a train. What do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's very, very interesting. So one, one person I discuss in, in the book is Poincaré, who is, yeah, this phenomenal yeah, geometric genius who was able, by, by, in, in, in according to his own um, description, in a very geometrical way to solve very deep problems and then to sort of write down the symbols later. And I think the, the fact that he was experiencing this imagistically is not at all accidental. Um, and that's what he's conscious of. What he's conscious of is the, is the, is the visual traces of the, of the thoughts. Um, but all you're ever conscious of, I think, is the, is the, is the sensory. Now, clearly, it must be that these, these thoughts, as he's generating them, and, and that being, I think, created one by one in the moment, he's not sort of reading off from some inner, inner mathematical textbook, um, but he's creating these thoughts one, in the moment, but all he's actually able to consciously report about is these kinds of imagistic traces. Um, this is kind of, you, all you're conscious of is the surface of your thoughts, not, nothing, nothing beyond that. But I do think the fact that people have a very strong sense of imagery being important in mathematics is, is absolutely very important. I don't think that's an that's a epiphenomenon. I think it's really ra probably rather crucial. Um, does your theory of memory say about free will? Not necessarily. I am, uh, however, 
a great believer in the utility of the idea of free will. So this is not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, I'm, I completely believe in a deterministic world or a deterministic up to quantum mechanical effects. But um, I think the intuition we have of, having, of, of ourselves being free is that we have the ability to create um, the, the interpretation of the present and the interpretation of what we should do in, freshly in the moment. And I think that's absolutely right. So you could have a story which says, well, you're, you're kind of in a behaviorist uh, nightmare. You've, you've, you've laid down various associations and you know, a stimulus comes along and you just fall, find yourself un, 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 unavoidably you know, charging towards the fridge and eating cheese or whatever because of that bell. And there's no stopping it. That would be a very different story. I think we're extraordinarily clever, creative, sort of metaphorical creatures who are able to be very flexible in our behavior. Now, you might say, well, but at base, it's all determined, isn't it, really? Um, and I think the answer to that is, is an answer Quine, I think, probably goes back before that. So the philosopher Quine has this nice comment that, that says, um, well, of course, free will's about being free to do as you will. It's not, about being, it's not about being free to will as you will. So <laughs> there's something kind of inherently bonkers about that idea. So you know, being free is to have the ability to, to think flexibly, decide what you want to do, and to do it. Not being free is um, being controlled by impulses that continually take over and force you down channels you didn't want to go down. Uh, so that's a sort of soft, sciencey, not deep, philosophically deep uh, solution. But uh, I, yeah, I like the idea of free will. Um, I, think, I think it's actually a deep and meaningful intuition about us, and I think it distinguishes us from lots of other, um, other creatures. Um, it seems common to get insights that appear fairly fully formed, say, in, well, or showering or something, just out of the blue. How, how might that kind of thing like, be explained? Yeah, well, I think there's, a, there's quite a lot of work on this in, in the world of problem solving research. And what it seems to be going on is that you're, you've done a lot of prior thinking, then you have a clue which you hadn't thought of before, or a little insight. You think, ah, maybe, maybe this will work. And mostly it doesn't. So the, the illusion is that when, when it does work, you think, oh, yeah, the whole thing's clear to me now, because now I, I see roughly how it's going to go. And look, oh, I'm putting the pieces in. Oh, look, they all fit. I sort of saw that all along. And I think that's a sort of retrospective <coughs> trick, because we all equally, and I certainly have this a lot, you probably all do, um, you have a problem, you think, ah, oh, I think this is it. Um, and in fact, it isn't. Uh, you, you try and put the pieces together. Nope, no, that doesn't work. OK, let's do it again. And when, but when it does work, you have the feeling that, oh yeah, well I, I did see there, correctly, all the pieces fitting together, because they did. Um, but I think actually that's, that's, a, that's a, bit of a bit of an illusion. Um, so there's an awful lot of, uh, a lot of artists and scientists have the, 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 um, uh, the story about saying, oh, you know, in a single moment I suddenly, vividly, completely saw the entire score of my sonata. Um, but when on press, being pressed, they say, oh, well, it did actually take you know, two weeks to write it, and you know, a lot of hard thinking. <laughs> uh, but I sort of saw how it was generally going. And I think that sense of, I sort of see the whole, it's all clear to me now, is something that is, a, there's a slight selection bias there. Um, however, of course, it's still true that sometimes you do have organizing thoughts, which allow you to see something in a more abstract way, which it does actually give you the structure which will you know, help everything fit together. But there you're thinking, it's a bit like seeing a face and thinking, I'm not just seeing the face, I'm also seeing the eyes and the eyelids and the pupils, and you're not. Right? When you're seeing the face, you're seeing the face. If you look at the eye, you're not seeing the face. It's so it's we have the illusion when you see it, or if you're looking at a whole body, you really aren't in a very real sense seeing the face anymore. But we have the illusion that if I have an abstract high level thought, I'm kind of seeing, grasping all the internal structure, but that's a, a bit of a fiction. We are out of time, unfortunately, so thank you again, Professor Nick Chater. Thank you.